It was a signature promise in the Liberals' 2015 election campaign. But last week, the federal government admitted that it would not meet its deadline to lift all the boil water advisories in First Nations communities across Canada by the year 2021. One community here in Ontario has been without potable water for more than a quarter century. Joining us now for more in Thunder Bay, Ontario, Alvin Fiddler. He is the Grand Chief of the Anishinaabe Aski Nation. And Willow Fiddler, staff reporter at the Globe and Mail. In Attawapiskat, Ontario, on the western coast of James Bay, writer, musician, and Indigenous advocate Adrian Sutherland. And in Wasega Beach, on the south shore of Georgian Bay, there's Jen Atkinson. She's the director of operations at the non-governmental organization called Water First. And we're delighted to welcome all four of you to our program tonight. We'd just like to start uh, perhaps by putting a map up that will just uh, lay out the background for those who are not as familiar with this issue as clearly you four folks are. Here's a map of the long-term advisories, both lifted and current in Ontario. And for those who are listening on podcast and can't see the map, I'll just describe it in some detail. We have green dots where the boil water advisories have been lifted and they are sprinkled all throughout the province in all regions of the province. But there are still many pesky red dots where boil water advisories still remain. So let's do the numbers here. Between 2015 and 2020, 97 long-term drinking water advisories have been lifted. That's the good news. However, 59 remain in 41 communities. Since 2016, the Government of Canada has made more than $2 billion in commitments to First Nations to build and repair water and wastewater infrastructure. All First Nations communities have access to trained personnel to sample and test drinking water, which is being monitored regularly. And in spite of all of that, we should say that the feds have now admitted that they will miss their deadline of lifting all the drinking water advisories in First Nations communities across Canada by March 2021. That was the original deadline. The Minister of Indigenous Services is named Mark Miller, and here's his explanation. Roll it, please, Sheldon. This has to be put into perspective. Um, this was an ambitious deadline from the get-go. Um, when we say that it was an Ottawa-imposed deadline or it was, an, it, was a, it was a deadline we set, um, those communities weren't sounded to say uh, what, what time was reasonable, nor, the, nor was their planning done. Uh, over the last, over the last uh, four or five years, we've been working in communities to lift those diligently, as, as you've seen. Uh, but the reality is when you engage with those communities, uh, you say you say to them. Obviously, they look at us and they say this wanted to, this needed to be fixed yesterday. It should never have happened in the first place. And just a little update on the minister. Uh, we asked him to be part of this program today. His schedule would not permit, but his office has said he will be on this program in the days ahead. So that's good to know. Uh, Chief Fiddler, to you first on this. I would like your reaction to the fact that they're <laughs> unable to make their commitment of March 2021. But one of the explanations that was also given is that the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, perhaps understandably, required several First Nations to close their borders, and therefore the access that federal officials wanted to, to have to First Nations communities in order to help effectuate this promise, well, obviously that fell apart because of COVID-19. Do you accept that explanation? I think it's important to note that uh these boil water advisories have been in place for a long, long time, uh, including the Scandiga, uh, going on 26 years, uh, including my own community of Muscat Dam going on 16 years. So this is uh, a long-standing issue, and uh, for the government to to say that COVID uh, will, uh, you know, is is not the reason to uh, for these delays uh, is is unacceptable, knowing that uh, they've had a long, long time uh, to deal with these uh, boil water advisories. So COVID-19 may go some way to explaining why, it, why it's not happening, but not far enough? Do I read that right in your explanation? Yeah, I mean, we, we've been at this now for a long time, uh, including uh, uh, myself as Grand Chief of NAN. When I became, uh, uh, when, I, when I took this, uh, this office five years ago, uh, we made uh, infrastructure a priority. Uh, we put a team together and we've been at this now for, uh, for at least five years. And for the government to now say that COVID uh, will, will delay things is just uh, uh, for for us and for people in the Scandinavia and, and and other communities that uh, that's not a uh, an acceptable reason. 
Okay, Willow, let's get you in here next. Uh, you heard the Grand Chief referred to in this Kentaga First Nation, uh, which is uh, well north of Lake Nipigon, up in northwestern Ontario. They've been under a boil water advisory for 25 years. It's the longest one in all of Canada. Uh, in the course of your reporting, you have spoken to residents there. Can you give us a sense about what life has been like for them with no potable water for a quarter of a century? Well, when you speak to community members and ask how they're feeling, they'll tell you they're frustrated and that they're tired. And, you know, we've heard uh, people say, and I've said before, that you have a whole generation of young people living in Niskandiga who live their entire lives without access to clean, uh, safe drinking water. They don't know what it's like to go, you know, grab a glass and, and fill it up at the at the sink and, and drink it. Um, that's just not possible for them. They don't know that. And uh, it, it's just, yeah, so it's this ongoing frustration. Um, daily routines are impacted. You know, their daily lives are impacted when you have to, you know, um, you, don't, you don't know whether the water is going to be on in the morning when you wake up, if you can flush the toilet, uh, you know, you're Families and, and children are dragging um, and carrying sleds and wagons with pails and jugs to fill up the water um, at the community's reverse osmosis station, which sits in a shed um, above the lake. And, uh, and, and even at times that isn't accessible. So it's been an ongoing um, years, decades of, of this frustration and not knowing. And people are tired. So they, the evacuees, and I'll just add, the evacuees have been here in Thunder Bay for over 40 days now. And that is extremely uh, tiring for them. No one wants to be here. Everyone would much rather be at home. It's, you know, close to Christmas. And now and now people are wondering if they're going to make it home for Christmas. Let me just do a quick follow-up with you, Willow. You, you mentioned evacuees who are now in Thunder Bay. Is that everybody from the First Nations Reserve there? Is, is everybody gone and, and moved to Thunder Bay? When they first evacuated, there was um, a group of about 24 people that stayed behind um, to, to make sure that, you know, the infrastructure there in the community was being taken care of, that, you know, the, the pipes weren't freezing because, of course, at that time, winter was just starting to uh, settle in. So there was, you know, concern of... Um, household pipes freezing up of course when when no one's there so there was a group that stayed behind um to to make sure that all of those things are taken care of feeding pets for example that kind of thing gotcha we, we should also say that we, uh, you and the grand chief both have the same last name and we suspect you are distantly related is that right we're we're both fiddlers. We're from separate, different communities, and I was I was kind of joking around. We're all fiddlers are, are, are related somewhere along the line, and, and uh, I imagine that's the case. For okay, us too. good, because I, I I imagine there you know people watching and listening to this would be asking the question, so we just want to get that on the record. Adrian, let me get you in here right now. You're in Attawapiskat off the western shores of James Bay. When's the last time you took a drink from a tap in your community? Um, never actually. I've, I've never been able to drink the water from the top here. How come? Well, the, the water here has been contaminated ever since we've had uh, running water. So since day one, uh, our house was first tied in in the late 90s, 1998. And uh, the water, the water um, quality has just been terrible. It's been really bad. Uh, certainly can't drink it. Uh, it's also very... Uh, um, hazardous to even bathe in it or 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 breathe the vapors from coming from the taps if you boil it is it okay to cook with no they're they're telling us not to cook uh with the food i'm uh, sorry cook they're telling us not to cook with the water that's the instruction we had last year and i as long as as far as i know that still stands now do you have so there's i, I just want to get a, a, a better understanding of the state of the water right now because I, I i had heard that atawapiskat is not under a boil water advisory, is that the case? That's correct. Now we're not we're not under an, any boil water advisories. Uh, we do have dispensaries in the community that were replaced last year as a result of the water contamination. Um, but from what I understand, the the water still has the contaminants in it. Uh, I haven't heard anything uh, as of last year about the water, other than don't drink it, uh, bathe. Uh, no, no greater than two minutes, uh, don't cook with it, don't breathe the vapors coming from the taps. That's the last I've heard, and that's been over a year ago, and I haven't heard anything new since. Okay, we're just going to clarify this. There's no boil water advisory, but there is a state of emergency declared related to your water, correct? 
Yeah, that's correct. There's uh, there's there's some contaminants uh, in the water and have have been there for quite some time. And from what I, to my knowledge, those haven't been dealt with yet. All right. You say you've never managed to take a drink of water out of the taps in Etowapiskat. In which case, what did you do for drinking water? Oh well, for for uh, for a long time as, as children, we grew up just collecting water from the, the local creeks, lakes, rivers mostly. Uh, we melted snow, uh, ice, and collected water from a hole that we kept open all winter long that the community uh, all collected their water from. So that we did that for many, many years. And in uh, some cases today, there are still families doing that, uh, including mine. Uh, we've collected water all th- all last year and snow from, from the river. And just because just we didn't feel safe uh, drinking even the, the water dispensary from the, uh, the RO setup that we have. Uh, RO setup? What does that stand for? Sorry, the the reverse osmosis uh, where we collect our drinking water. Gotcha. Okay, thanks for that. Jen, let's get you in here now. Uh, Water First is the name of your organization. Tell us what you folks do. Uh, Great. Water First is a Canadian charity that uh, works in collaboration with Indigenous communities to address drinking water and water challenges. Uh, We work with our partners through training and education. And as partners, we're working to bring together young people into the field of drinking water and water science. Adrian just told us that his water's been contaminated for as far back as he can remember. What kind of contamination do you typically see in water systems uh, in, in the areas that you are surveying? Well, there's a wide variety of different contaminants. Um, there's chemicals, nitrates, phosphates. There could be heavy metals, lead, arsenic. And of course, we have uh, bacteria. I'm sure you've Part of E. coli, uh, viruses, um, protozoa such as uh, Giardia and Cryptosporidium, um, and then in a treatment system, uh, there can be contaminants as part of the actual treatment process if it's not looked after properly. And how do all these chemicals get into the water system in the first place? Some of them are naturally occurring. Some of them are a result of the environment, um, neighboring effects. We look at stormwater. We look at runoff. We look at the groundwater system and um, some of them are there naturally and some of them are part of uh, how they enter our groundwater system. Chief Fiddler, let me go back to you with this next question and that is why has this been such an unsolvable, intractable problem for so many decades? Yeah, I think you just, uh, I think, you know, your, your question I think is part of the answer. It's, it's a long-standing issue. There's a lot of history uh, to this. Uh, going back to uh, this, the creation of, of reserves, you know, that uh, a lot of uh, our communities were put in places where uh, it wasn't suitable to live in. And, uh, and the water source was, uh, uh, wasn't, was always questionable. Uh, so it, it's a long-standing issue and uh, it'll, it'll require uh, a lot of work uh, with, with government, working with First Nations and true partnership uh, to create uh, standards, for example, or, or to create regulations. To create regulation or to create a legislation that will uh, uh, lead to uh, to standards and and uh, uh, building uh, capacity at the community level for communities to be able to run uh, their water treatment plants uh, in a way that uh, that they were designed to. Well, Will, let's figure this out a little more deeply here because it cannot be that com- you would think anyway that it wouldn't be that complicated to build a water treatment plant in every community that needed one. Uh, it ought not to take 25 years to do that. So what's been the holdup here? Well, I think um, Alvin is, is right. I mean, the, the infrastructure in, in, in most of our First Nation communities just have been, um, were non-existent to begin, to begin with. And, and substandard. So when you go back like 30, 40 years, you know, when, when reserves were uh, developing infrastructure, um, I think the solutions have always been substandard and never have taken into account things that like um, growing populations, for example. And, and then you run into, um, you know, problems that compound um, this, for example, housing. I mean, the, the, you could say the same thing with housing, the infrastructure um, just hasn't been there to, you know, um, it has been substandard. And, um, yeah, I mean, so it's just, it's a pile of, pile of problems over decades that has led to this. Okay, a pile of progr- problems over decades. Adrian, to you next. Who do you, you know, the fact that you haven't been able to take a drink of water out of your own tap 
for your entire life in Attawapiskat. Who, who do you blame for that? <laughs> oh, that's, that's a good question. I mean, uh, at this point, uh, you know, I guess if I had to blame someone, it might, I might want to blame the, the feds, um, especially since they do have a, 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 a judiciary responsibility to oversee the infrastructure needs of our communities. And, you know, it's disappointing to learn that they're not going to be meeting this commitment to end the, the, the uh, boil water advisories. Um, and I would question whether or not this government has the ability to, to address the issues uh, of water uh, once and for all, ever. Why do you say that? Well, I mean, I've been here, I'm, I'm 44 years old, you know, uh, I, I'm, I'm almost middle-aged. Uh, I don't know if I, ever, if I ever will see our water issues addressed in my lifetime. Honestly, but you start to lose hope, you know, after so long, uh, you know, uh, you know, commitments, uh, especially the, this big commitment that the government made not being fulfilled. Um, it's frustrating, you know, you just kind of, what, what's the point of even talking about it anymore? And that's how you feel, uh, as a resident here, uh, it's very, uh, very worrisome too. Um, you know, your family, uh, is, is, is sort of not even having one of the most very basic human needs being met. And, uh, you know, and the attitudes I think towards, um, some of these longstanding issues are just not quite serious enough. How, how does that manifest itself? You say the attitudes don't seem serious enough. What what evidence would you point to to suggest that that's the case? Well, I mean, well, for one, I think these these issues are are although there there are many many problems and they're co compounded by more. Um, I think they're 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 very fixable. Um, um, we need the resources. Uh, it's clear that what we need here in Ottawapiskat, uh, we need a new facility. Uh, don't throw band-aid solutions at us because they don't work. That's what they've been doing for so many years. Um, so we need a real solid plan. We need a new facility, a new water, uh, new water intake, a new water source. It's already been identified. Um, so why can't we move forward now and find ways to to make this happen? I just I just don't understand it. Adrian, uh, forgive the personal question here, but uh, are you married? Do you have kids? Yes, I do. I have four kids and four grandkids. Uh, so it's a very it's very worrisome for me knowing that the the water coming from our tap, I mean we got to bathe the little ones in the, in in this water too. So it's in and out. You know these are concerns. I, it's constantly on your mind. Uh, it's on your mind when you wake up, when you go to bed. Uh, so it's very uh, it, it's troublesome. Hmm. Jen Atkinson, who should we blame for the fact that things are the way they are? Well, I think it's pretty hard for me to point blame where I'm sitting, but I can tell you that. It's a very complicated situation, um, as Willow said earlier. This is a, in my opinion, it's a situation that's been neglected for a long time, and it's allowed to grow. Um, there's over 600, maybe 630 communities, I believe, in Canada, and there's no one size solution that will fit all. Um, there needs to be a holistic approach that includes consultation with a community, um, the proper location and design of a water treatment plan. And then once a treatment plant is in place, we need to uh, be able to have skilled operators who can look after the plant and also have a long-term plan that includes succession. Um, it's not just one challenge. It's a, quite a few going on here all at one time. Well, let me pick up on that with Chief Fiddler because I have heard that criticism numerous times in the past. It's not just a matter of building a new water treatment facility. You need local people who have the skills to be able to run it and, of course, fix it when it breaks down. Has that been a problem over the years? Yeah, that's been one of the uh, one of the factors that lead to uh, uh, these boil water advisories is just the lack of capacity, uh, the lack of trained personnel to run uh, these water treatment plants uh, in our communities. That's something that uh, we've been advocating uh, for the last few, uh, uh, you know, the last uh, at least the time I've been in, in this office is for, uh, for the feds to make these investments at the community level. You just don't build a $10 million water trip plant and then walk away. You need to uh, provide investments uh, at the community level to be able to uh, build that capacity for, for the community to run it in the long term. 
But again, it, it does not seem beyond imagination that local people could go to whatever training facilities or community colleges or whatever in order to get the skills to, to run these facilities and repair them when they break down. Um, you know, I, I guess I'm asking the same question again. Why, why has this been so problematic to fix? The solution seems available in plain sight. Yeah, we need, it's, it's been tried before, but it, it seems to be ad hoc, piecemeal, uh, in terms of training uh, programs, uh, we just need to figure out a way uh, to uh, make it uh, more sustainable uh, so that, uh, uh, first of all, we eliminate all these uh, BWAs and, and prevent uh, you know, uh, our communities from getting on back, getting back on these uh, on this list in the future. So it has to be uh, a long-term sustainable uh, process uh, going forward. Okay, Willow, the people that you talk to, that you have talked to for your reporting for the Globe and Mail, whom do they blame for the situation? Well, I'm just thinking of Ms. Scandiga here in, in my recent conversations with Chief, Chief Chris Munias. Um, in, in his, when that, not long after they were evacuated, he came up with a list of demands um, that would have to be met before he would let his community members return home safely. And one of those is um, an investigation into the business practices of um, like the contractors, engineers, and everyone else involved in these projects. I mean, these are huge, uh, multi-million dollar projects. And, and while um, Indigenous services will say, you know, in terms of the boil water advisories, it's up to the First Nations to lift those, um, kind of, you know, giving it off to the First Nation. Um, but, but they have, you know, requirements that, that need to be met. So when Chief Chris Munias calls for an investigation into the business practices of those who have, um, you know, been involved in this project that's been uh, delayed o over years now and ongoing, that is needed. And I also think there, there's a barrier when it comes to the, the bureaucrats and the bureaucracy of um, the Department of Indigenous Services. And, uh, and we saw that in some of CBC's reporting um, where Ann Stoughton has been replaced on the Nistanaga water file. Um, so th those are, you know, all things that uh, need to be looked at for sure. Chief Fiddler, I well remember Brian Mulroney, the uh, 18th Prime Minister of Canada, once saying, don't compare me to the almighty, compare me to the alternative. Can, can the current government of Canada say, compared to the alternatives, we've done pretty well at this? Do you think they can say that? Uh, I don't know if I, oh, I could answer that. Uh, you know, my response would be that this has been an, an issue uh, for our communities for a long time, and it doesn't really matter which uh, party forms government, provincially or federally. Uh, I think what we're saying is that we need to, uh, you know, just we're 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 always reaching out to government uh, for for help. For, uh, for assistance, and uh, I think what we're saying now is that uh, you know, this has to be a collaborative approach uh, in a, in a long-term, sustainable way that we need to uh, acknowledge uh, you know, that you know, we, we've had these problems for a long time, and we need to, uh, you know, whether it's, it's creating legislation, as I said, uh, creating regulations, uh, creating centers that will... Uh, uh, solve this problem in the longer term. But you've got 97 long-term advisories that have been lifted. D does the federal Liberal government get any credit for that? Well, I, I think it was last week I said that, uh, you know, even though we we seem to be making progress, uh, for example, when I became, when I took this office five years ago, uh, we had 34 uh, boil water advisories, and then uh, we're down to 14. Uh, and 14 still too, one too many, and, uh, you know, I don't think we should be patting ourselves in the back until we uh, eliminate that to zero. Understood. Adrian, I'm going to ask you a bit of a strange question here, okay? Humor me for a second. Uh, I have no doubt that if I... You know, I have no doubt that Indigenous audiences understand the answer to this question, but non-Indigenous audiences may not. They may be wondering why, if you haven't been able to drink from your taps for 44 years, why don't you just leave? What's the answer to that? That's a that's a good question. Actually, I, I get told that a lot. Actually, why, why don't you just get up and leave? Um, uh, not only just from re regular Canadians, but uh, even from um, 
uh, government officials. You know, that's that's the attitude or that's the question I get quite a bit, uh, even in music industry. Uh, and, you know, my answer is I'm I'm deep rooted here. You know, this is my ancestral lands. This is where I grew up. This is where I raised my family, the Cree traditional way. And this is the only place where I feel at home uh, in this entire country and where I'm free to be who I am. Uh, this is one of the reasons why I choose to live here and continue to to want to raise my family here. That's the thing I wanted to get at. I, I, I think we need people to understand that the connection you feel to the land on which you have lived for generations and uh, are raising your family and your grandchildren on, the connection you feel is is more profound than even not being able to drink the water can force you away from. Have we got that right? That's correct. Okay, let's go on. Uh, we've got just a few minutes left here, and I guess I want to know, Chief Fiddler, uh, they're not going to meet the March 2021 deadline. They've already established that. At what point in the future do you think it's possible for First Nations in this province to be able to drink water out of the tap everywhere? Hopefully soon. I mean, that's still uh, uh, our priority uh, is to, you know, uh, at least in, 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 uh, in Treaty 9 and Treaty 5 in, in the Nantes Territory, as I said, we have 14 communities uh, on this list. And and even though the community seems, or, or the government seems to be walking back on the commitment to eliminate uh, bottled water advisories uh, and first stations, uh, you know, we don't accept that. Uh, in fact, we've said that we should be uh, doubling our efforts uh, to eliminate uh, all the uh, communities from this uh, list, especially while we're while we're experiencing a, a global pandemic, and that's something we've been uh, telling our communities over the last uh, uh, nine months uh, since this pandemic was declared uh, in early March. That you know, washing your hands and and staying hydrated, drinking lots of water. Uh, disinfecting your home, and, 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 and those are very difficult things to do if you don't have access to uh, uh, clean and safe drinking water. So we need to uh, make sure that the work gets done to uh, uh, fix uh, these uh, water treatment plants and uh, getting these communities off the list. Well, that's a good point. When you are told to wash your hands in order to stave off COVID-19 and you've got contaminated water, what do people do? Well, I think that's the... Uh, the question we're, you know, that we're we're struggling with right now, and that's something that uh, you know I hope the the government of Canada uh, hears, uh, you know, leaders from uh, from Chief Munias and uh, and communities like Sandy Lake and, and Fort Hope and Muskegon communities that have been uh, on this list for a long time, uh, that uh, they need to hear what leaders are saying, uh, they need to hear what what children like Vidab and uh, Munias are saying, that they need to. Uh, um, listen to those voices and, and provide answers to the questions that they've been asking for a long time. Hmm. Jen Atkinson, you're trying to be part of the solution here. You know the size of the problem. Uh, how many years down the road are we looking at before every First Nations person in this province can drink water from their own tap safely? I wouldn't be able to tell you the exact number of years. Um, I know that it's absolutely unacceptable to have communities in Canada who can't drink their water. And I know that um, this challenge is going to take time, more time than we would all like. It needs money, training, education. We have to be able to work in consultation and collaboration with our partners. And another $1.5 billion sure wouldn't hurt. Willow, what's your estimate of how long it's going to take to finally solve all this? Uh, given what's how the last five years have gone, I mean, I'm not... Uh, I, I don't know. I don't, I'm not... I, I don't see it happening anytime soon, unless there's a, a major, you know, political will, I guess, um, or will from from those uh, all those partners and players involved to to really just quit messing around. And uh, you know, like Alvin says, you have to listen to the communities. You have to listen to the people on the ground there who who know, who have the experience, who have the knowledge, um, and, and the solutions as well. Adrian, you get the last 30 seconds. You think those grandkids of yours are ever going to be able to drink water out of the tap in Attawapiskat? Yeah, they, I think so. I mean, uh, I, I, you know, it, it's difficult. It's a difficult question to answer because um, 
considering the history we've seen and, and the, inac the inactivity the inactivity we've seen uh, around these long-standing issues, it's very really, very difficult for me to, to, to answer that question. Uh, but I certainly uh, believe and, and hope that my grandkids will one day have safe drinking water coming from the taps. And uh, I, I'd like to be a part of that solution, you know. I've always said I'm willing to put my, my um, you know, uh, resources and, and, and thoughts and try to bring solutions to these issues. Because uh, as an Indigenous person, I think we're part of that, part of the solution in trying to figure out um, these long-standing water issues and, and, and all the other issues that exist in these communities. Well, I know everybody watching this certainly hopes it happens sooner than later, and I want to thank all four of you. Adrian Sutherland, Chief Alvin Fiddler, Willow Fiddler, Jen Atkinson, it's good of all of you to spend so much time with us on TVO tonight. Many thanks and good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.